Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. How is everyone? All right. Well, thanks for coming out so early on a Saturday. Um, my name's Tim Hills. I'm the historian with McMinimans. And uh, this is one of the most fun events for me that we do all year. Um, Edgefield is a special place, and I've grown up and worked here uh, right for decades. And um, so to be able to celebrate the history of this place and, and where it's gone and where it is today, uh, we're thrilled to do that. And I uh, really appreciate you guys turning out. And we have a really fun lineup today of speakers um, that I think you'll really enjoy covering different aspects of uh, Edgefield's history and also the, the local history that surrounds Edgefield. Um, in addition, we have really a one-of-a-kind uh, exhibit of historic photos, thanks to uh, Steve Leal, who has an amazing and, and probably unsurpassable uh, collection of uh, East County, mainly Corbett area uh, photographs, a collection is just stunning, and every year he pulls out a little more taste of uh, uh, his overall collection. So thanks, Steve, for sharing those. Yay! <laughs> so we're going to start off with uh, Chuck Rollins' uh, presentation, which is about, it's called Camp Dogs, as you can read. Uh, and um, uh, Chuck was a logger himself, and so he's always been fascinated about the subject. Um, and uh, has met so many people and done a lot of uh, research and interviews and uh, always comes up with great material. And this is something new that he hasn't shown before. Um, so we're, we're excited for that. Um, following his presentation is going to be Sharon Nesbitt, who's going to be talking about basically how she saved Edgefield. Um, and of course, being an uh, employee of McMinimans, we're quite pleased that you did that for us. <laughs> And also for the whole area around here. It's, like I said, an amazing place. And it came this close to just disappearing. So uh, she will give you the details and uh, explain how that happened uh, and how she made that possible. Then the third presentation, I think I just saw him come in. Uh, Gary Law and his wife, Bev, are going to be presenting about um, this year's centennial of the Vista House. Uh, you have all been to the Vista House, right, in, in the gorge, and just turned 100 this year, and uh, it's an amazing story, again, like Edgefield, that it's even still standing, and it's due to efforts from Gary and uh, many other people that, it's, that it is still there, so. All right, Chuck? I'd like to introduce Chuck Rollins, the president of Crown Point Country Historical Society and this year's Grand Marshal of the uh, Corbett Fourth of July Parade. It really was an honor and it was great to see him. What kind of car was that? 1966 Cadillac. My God, <laughs> that was fantastic. It wasn't mine, by the way. <laughs> it fit you though. Um, and Chuck's going to talk about, um, as, as uh, we said, a uh, great story about uh, camp dogs. And I just wanted to mention uh, that he is in the middle of leading the Hercule Herculean effort to build uh, the museum for uh, the Crown Point Country Historical Society, which is right beside uh, the uh, Corbett. Country Market, if you know where that is. Uh, stop by and see it, and maybe you want to give a few details yeah. about that. All right, Chuck Rollins, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Just a quick update on our museum project. It's, it's a labor of love for the entire community, from the school kids to the elders in our community. Everybody has stepped up to make it happen, and we poured our foundation yesterday. So we're very excited about that. I want to thank Tim and Edgeville for allowing me to be here and share this story with you today. And before I get into the story, I want to talk about two things real quick like. 
The images that you are going to see today are all what they call real photo postcards. In, in 1906, Kodak came out with a camera that was small, lightweight, that you could take anywhere with you and take a photograph. And when you took that picture, it would come back as a photographic postcard, which for one cent you could mail anywhere in the United States. Well, loggers love to have their pictures taken, so with this little camera, they went around, they took tens of thousands of images, and I've made it my mission in life to try to find as many of them as I can. Back in, for the last 40 years, I've been on this hunt for those postcards to look for the images to use in a book, which I published in 2011, and it was called The Loggers, How They Saw It, and it was a story of the timber industry using their photographs to tell their story. And this is my second printing and I'm almost out. If anybody wants one, I have a few left in the back. That's my advertisement for the book. <laughs> but it was during that time that I, you couldn't help but realize, looking at all these images, that they had dogs in them. And as Tim said, I talked to a lot of old timers and they all started sharing camp dog stories. The roles the dog played. How, why were the dogs in the camps? And today my hope is that without me saying anything, the pictures will speak for themselves. But I am going to talk because I have that <laughs> bad habit of liking to yak. But, um, I just got a postcard last week from Oklahoma Logging Camp. And a fellow's writing his sister and he says, we're 43 miles from nowhere. And I thought, what a great title. So I may use that for the title of my new book, which is going to be on the dogs. And a lot of these images you'll see today will be in the book. Now, most of them are one-of-a-kind images. Let's see, Tim, do I operate this? Or, or how, you just show me what to push and I'll, I think I know, but I don't want to push the wrong button. I can stand here and do it if you want. Or if I know what, just that, that one. All right, so as I started, like I said, I looked at all these images and you just couldn't help but seeing that there was dogs in them. And so I started looking back to every postcard I ever bought, which is around 2,000 images, and probably 20% all had dogs in them. So I started talking and hearing these different stories and decided that a slideshow needs to be done so we can tell the story of what roles the dogs play. Same roles they play today. Think about it, you're in a logging camp, you're 43 miles from nowhere, there's no family, you're with a bunch of men, you're out in the boonies, you work hard all day, it's one of the most dangerous jobs there is, and when you come home, you're around the same group of guys. You go into the mess hall, you're not allowed to talk in the mess halls. Too many fights that way. So you had to be quiet, and they had a guy walking around, and if he caught you talking, he'd smack you with a stick. It's easier to keep the peace, so there was no alcohol allowed in most camps. Same reason, they didn't like the fighting. So the dogs roll, you come home from work all day, no one's there to see you except the four-legged animals. And as we all know, they're always happy to see you. Now there's two types of photographs in these postcards. They're the ones the loggers took, then there's the ones that the professional photographers took. And I forgot to point out something. On these cameras, on the back side, there's a little lever. If you lift that up, you can write on the negative. So when the negative came back, it would be identified. As you see here, this was a professional photographer, but he still did it the same way. Now, one thing about professional photographers, they were a smart bunch of guys. They'd go into a logging camp and they figured, well, if I took a picture of one logger, I'm only going to sell one picture. So they'd get them all together, take the picture, and then that way they got a real good chance of selling more than one image. But even though this is a big crew, most logging camps were five to 10 to 300 men. It varied. They varied in size. Where's the dog? Where's the dog? He's got the best seat in the house. But there again, the men wanted the animal in the picture with them because he was part, part of the team, should we say. And of course, 
The camps were remote, very crude. Most of them had no windows, log style. But with this camera, if someone said they're taking a picture, the whole crew would come out. And I always just like this one because the dog is in the perfect spot. <laughs> the timber of the Northwest, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 foot in diameter was very common in its day. So I'm just, uh, the next few images, I want to give you an idea of the timber that the men had to work. The road conditions, that's a plank road, no asphalt. Can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. With these, I scanned these photos for the presentation for Chuck, and you know, these are photo postcards, so they're pretty small. And that, especially that last one, uh, with the guys holding their arms around the tree trunk, I never saw those guys until I scanned it and blew it up. I didn't see them either. I didn't see them either. Go back to that. <laughs> Whoops, wrong, wrong way. See him? Oh yeah, I saw those guys. Oh there! Good job. <laughs> the old saying was the trees were so thick you couldn't walk through them. I this is a road up in Washington, but I put this image in so you could just see how thick the trees were and think of this. 180 feet to that point. So not only were they massive, they were extremely tall. But it created a darkness and nothing underneath would grow. And so when you went to these logging camps, I talked to a man, he was 103 years old, he just gotten married. Said he was enjoying life. But he went up to the logging camp, camp up on Larch Mountain in 1918. Actually, I talked to him a few years ago. And his dad was the foreman up there. And I said, well, where was the camp? And he said, all I can remember is we took a car up to the sawmill, got on a train, and went to where the tracks ended. And that's where he grew up, up on Larch Mountain. I also wanted to show how big and how much power these, these trees have. This is a railroad grade that literally got smashed by this one tree. Now, in 1980, when Mount St. Helens blew up, they were really worried that in the bull run, there were several fissures and they were concerned that they may get active because of the volcanic activity. So they put up all these sensitive to detect uh, the ground. What are those things called? I'm drawing a blank here. Yeah, side to, to measure the seismic activity in the bull run. And all of a sudden, every day at 6 o'clock, from 1 o'clock, 1 1.2, 2, all these they were getting all this activity, but it always stopped at 1 o'clock. They finally realized they were up there logging in the bull run, and every time those trees hit the ground, it was setting off, and they gave them big concern. They had all kinds of experts up there, and the loggers had to quit at 1 o'clock. So I just wanted to show what the men were up against. Okay, every... The camps themselves, like I say, were located at the end of the line. They were pretty crude. The better the camp, the more often the men would stay there. The living conditions, it was hard to get men to stay in the camp if the living conditions were bad food, bad housing. But this is just throw it up real quick like, but as you can tell, there are no roads. So when you were done working at the end of the day, you didn't go to town, you didn't go to the tavern. You went right back to camp. This is where everybody ate. And then they'd go back to their bunk houses. Another remote camp. This one, you can actually see the dog. I tried to have dogs in all the images, but I didn't quite have enough. But there's the dog. This is the cook shed. They're doing dishes, getting ready for dinner at night. Another camp, those cars, those buildings were actually brought in on rail cars and moved off. And then when the camp was done and they moved to a new location, they'd move them back onto the rail cars and then move them to another area. But they also had what they called mobile camps. The camp stayed on the rail cars. And so when they were done logging an area, they just hooked the train up and moved to the next location, then take the tracks up and then use them on another job. This is actually in Wisconsin, but it was a seven, the reason I put it in there was 17 cars. And there was for the horses, 
They had two stables for the horses, a blacksmith shop. They even had a shower, which back in those days, a shower was a premium. Any camp that had a shower, men wanted to work there. But there again, it was a mobile camp that could move from site to site. I enjoy this one just because it shows the log building, which was the cookhouse. That's the building they slept in, and you can just see it's dead of winter, and these were the type of living conditions. So not only are you 100 miles or 43 miles from nowhere, you're out in the boonies, it's cold, but there's the dogs that were always happy to see you. And the main function of the dogs was for the morale of the men. And so some camps had more than one dog. What's that? The women on the side of that picture, they, I assume, were the cooks. Yeah. Uh, there were two women in right. that picture. Yeah, so were, were the women typically? There was women in the camps, and normally if you were, say, you were the cook of the camp, you generally brought your wife with you or and your children. So there will be a few images you'll see, see kids. And, um, but as a rule, they were home taught. And as you can be able to see in other images coming up, just how remote it was so it was a hard life for kids but they were there were women in the camps and this isn't a derogatory term they were called flunkies and their job was to clean up help wash dishes and I met a woman and she was so proud of that that she was a flunky and everybody's looking at her but she wore that with a badge of pride because she was in those conditions she helped and she was part of something she was part of history and so there are a few women, as you will see. Now, every logging camp needed different expertise or people that could do certain jobs. You had timber fallers. Their jobs were to cut the tree down. And in the Northwest, they stood on what they called a springboard. And the idea of it was to get them away from the swell of the tree and into better wood. But there again, here they're on the work site. Here's their camp dog in the picture. <laughs> and another one. The, the idea was, the old saying used to be that when you cut a tree down, you fell it toward the sawmill. That was easier to get it there, but that just was an old folk saying. You fell the trees according to the lean of the tree and the lay of the land. But there again, I got a couple more of the fallers. This was taken on a Sunday, and I believe this was the photographer sitting in the cut. But if they knew that a photographer was coming, they'd prepare the tree and then they'd be ready to all go out there and stand by to get their picture took. <laughs> but even there again, there's the camp dog. And then one more falling. <laughs> this was the second highest paid job, was the timber fallers, because it was considered the most dangerous. And then another thing to think about when you're away from home and your family, the big camps, some of them lost a man a day. That's how dangerous the work was. And I was doing a talk in Sandy, and an old guy came up to me and said, in one day they lost three men. After the first man was killed, the bull buck, which was with the boss, he told him, I'll just put him behind a stump. We'll probably get another one before the day's over. Because they weren't going to stop working. They just kept moving logs. Once the trees were fell, they needed to be cut into lengths. So you needed what they called buckers. They bucked the logs. And here's some young guys with their dogs getting ready to cut it to length. And the sawmills would set the length. So if they wanted 20-foot want logs or 24-foot logs or 40-foot logs, they would let the buckers know what they wanted. I put this one in. It, they're cutting firewood. Look at the tree they're cutting up for firewood. But this is a big drag saw, which they did use on the landings to help cut the wood. And those, there's this ka-chink, ka-chink. Just all day long, nothing fast, but they were steady. And so that's a, a drag saw out, out in the woods. And what's that, about an eight foot, seven foot Douglas fir? And then once the trees were felled, this is a 14 foot diameter tree. And they, they squared up the end. But there again, here out in the middle of the forest, here's the camp dog with the men. You also needed teamsters, that's what they, they were called. And they ran the horses, the mules, and the oxen. 
And this is in southern Oregon. It was really easy to move logs when the ground was frozen. They did it in the Midwest, but they also did it here in Oregon. And if you look really hard, can everybody see the dog? And so he's along for the ride. <laughs> this is one I really enjoy. These are cedar shake bolts, in, in the, and they use them today for roofing. But these are four footers. I did a lot of cedar shake bolts. We always cut them in two foot and could hardly lift them. These are four foot. And the idea with making long shake bolts is, is when they split them, you could put more of the cedar shake to the weather. And so the longer the, the shake bolts, the more cedar was exposed to the weather so you could do a roof a lot faster. But I just like it because of the, it's everybody's perfectly posed. And to get your animal perfectly posed when you're just taking a picture. Is they also, the Teamsters also built the roads. And I, I got Steve here to back me up. I can't remember what they call these things again. Fresno. Or Fresno. Fresno. You see the handles? This was the caterpillar of its day. It got hooked behind the horses and they would drag it and it'd be full of dirt and they'd haul it off and dump it. And so that was one of the jobs of the Teamsters was also to build the roads. Was that like a, a bucket? It, it yes. And we actually had three that were used when they built the scenic highway, which we'll have at our museum. But they were actually, we got them from the fellow that was one of the crew bosses. And so we're very excited about that. Also in the woods, to get the logs out, they had what they called the big wheels. And you see this chain right here? The horses would go out into the woods and straddle the log. Then they'd put that chain under it, lift up one end, then it made it real easy to drag it. But I just liked it because that dog seemed so happy. But there again, you see all these images, and the men want the dog to be there with them. Everybody see the dog? Oh, there he is. oh, okay. <laughs> well, there's some hard ones coming up. <laughs> now, besides the, 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 the Teamsters, because they use horses, they also had what they called steam shows or steam donkeys. And they had cable where they could reach out into the woods and drag the logs to what they called a landing where they could be loaded and hauled to the sawmill. Now, I think most of us here remember the little rascals when we were growing up. Doesn't that dog look somewhat familiar? But the, the pride in the animal and the men just shows that bond that they had. This is one of three images, I only put one in. And what's really strange is three postcards of the guys playing with the dog on the landing. I bought these three images over a 10 year period from three different locations. Like I say, when these images came back, you could write, here's your Uncle John working in the woods, put a stamp on it, and you mailed it off. And so that's part of the fun, was gathering all these images. But they're playing around with the dog on the stump there. This is lunchtime, and for those that don't know, some of us old timers, that's an old, old lunch pail right there. That's what they look like. This is 1908, 1910-ish. And all these images are from 1908, 1906 to 1920, give or take. But even at lunchtime, there's the dog. Okay, first test. How many dogs do you see? Big steam donkey, everybody's to get their picture took. And they had a sense of humor. He's got the oil can like he's uh, getting a drink. But anybody see more than two dogs in this picture? Three. Three. One, two, three. Those steam donkeys, they were built, when they were brought out to the woods, they were mounted on sleds. So you had a master carpenter that would build these sleds. And the idea with the steam donkey was it pulled itself. Wherever it needed to go, it just ran out the cable. And which brings up a real quick story that the first two steam donkeys brought out to use on Larch Mountain right out here, they were, went up the river to Bridal Vale, and Mr. Palmer, who owned the company at the time, told his boss to go 
get these and move them up on the mountain so they can start using them. Well, about four hours later, the boss comes in, or the bull buck, and he says, I've wore out three teams of horses and a team of oxen. I can't budge that machine. <laughs> Mr. Palmer looked at him and said, start a fire in it. It pulls itself. <laughs> and it took them a week to go up to the top of Larch Mountain where they were logging. But they were mounted on these sleds, and again, here's the dogs. I think, all, I think the rest of the images do have dogs in them. Now, once the trees were fell and the steam donkey was set up and they were ready to pull them in, they'd put this, what they call a choker, around the log and they'd pull it to the landing. Now, if you look at this log, you see this beveling? That's called sniping a log. And the idea is that when you pull a log on the ground, if it comes up against something, it'll ride over it. And so, by seeing the log that sniped, you know, it was ground log. When you use steam power, sometimes they high lead it and lift the, the logs right off the ground and pull them in. But I know by seeing that, you wouldn't snipe the log if you weren't gonna drag it on the ground. But there again, there's the dog. Quick question, uh, with the sled that it was in that uh, photo before, did they build those Yes, yeah. and uh, they generally use prime stock, and they would bring in master carpenters, and most of them were like millwrights or ship carpenters, because they were experienced on squaring logs, and you, there was a lot of work involved in building those sleds. They also had chutes where they would drag the logs down into the landing so they could be loaded out, and again, this is a professional photographer, but there's a the dog, plain view, men showing her off. Now this is California. This is the redwoods and they're snaking logs out. And the point I want to emphasize is I don't care if you're in Maine, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, anywhere there was logging, there were camps and there were dogs in the camps. And this is just showing how much the men loved and respected their animals. Now this is, a, once the logs are on the landing, they would be loaded onto trains, trucks, or use the water. Now, this log's 40 feet long, and I just es estimated that it's seven foot in diameter on the other end. That's 17,000 board feet. Now, when you see a log truck going by today, full of 40 foot logs that are six inches in diameter, each one of those logs has 60 board feet. So, the volume increases dramatically as the, as the tree gets bigger. But this little device here is called an end hook, and they would be pounded into both ends, and that's how they lifted the logs. And I'll show you here. Um, well, I'll show you with a different one. But this is still on the landing, and they chain these on. But it's lunchtime, and the dog's in the camp. Whoops. There's a picture missing. Anyway, you also had to have engineers. And their job was, of course, to run the train and gives you an idea of the size of the woods. And look how thick the trees are, but the engineer has his dog with him. This is a little logging town called Rajuda, Oregon. It is no longer a town, it's ghost town. And that's what happened with a lot of these camps. Some turned into communities that are still active today, but most of them were short-lived and they moved on. But this is the engineer and his wife, and if you were the engineer, you got a house. You didn't have to live in the bunkhouse. The other way they hauled logs was on the waterways. Once you got it to water, you could float the logs anywhere. This is British Columbia. The logging camp is 300 miles away, so they just brought in this, this raft of logs and they filled up with supplies and now they're heading back to the camp but they brought the dog with them. Now someone asked me why are those tires on there? Same reason they're on trailers when you drive around, is to keep the roof, when the wind blows, it wants to move a lot. And then there was the log trucks. Now of all the images, personal preference here, I always wanted to find a dog with a log truck. And last year Steve was able to find this on eBay for me, but there's the dog. 
This is in about 1914, international. One log load, we see the end was sniped, so we knew it was ground log. Even at the sawmill, this is um, Finn Town. Does anybody know what town that is? I know Sharon knows. Astoria? Astoria. Astoria. And this is a sawmill in Astoria, and even there, there's the dogs. But back in the logging camps, like I say, they're 43 miles from nowhere. And when you start looking at all these images, you start seeing the dogs. And I like to put two and two together to get five. But if you look at these three guys, they look like they've been horsing around. And then you see their hats in the mud. You can't help but think they were messing around just before the photograph. But they're deep in the forest. They have their animal. And they want it to be in the picture. And it just reinforces that bond that the men had. This is in Michigan. It's, what's interesting is as you learn history, you'll start seeing how different parts of the country, they wore different clothing. So right away, I know this isn't the Northwest. And so that's half the fun is trying to figure this stuff out, which we're still working on. But picture time, get out the pipe, get the dog, get your picture took. All right, how many dogs do you see in this picture? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Cut him off. No. I see one. I see one there, one there, and one there. <clears throat> Three dogs. Again, no, no windows in the bunkhouse, no windows in the mess hall. So it, it's got to be very depressing life. And there again, the dogs were there to bring happiness and joy. Just let the men know that they're appreciated. And dogs just doing their thing, being a dog. Now, I met this little old lady. She told me about a camp dog. His name was Rex. And another job the dogs had was they were on varmint patrol, which meant they'd chase off the skunks, raccoons, coyotes, anything trying to get into the camp and, and create havoc. Well, she tells about Rex, how he was on Varmint patrol one day, and she said he found one. And he snuck up on this animal, had his tail straight up, had a white stripe around, uh, running down his back, and they heard this yelp. And Rex learned that day, you never sneak up on a skunk. And she laughed and said the crew got some, orange, or some tomato juice and gave him a tomato juice bath. And about two weeks later, the smell was gone, but they had a funny looking orange dog. Oh my God. But there again, look how primitive that mess hall is. That's just tar paper. And the men are getting their picture took, but the dog's in, in the image. Now, someone, Heckler over there, <laughs> said that, well, what about cats? Were there cats in the camp? Well, you bet there was. Here's one right there. <laughs> And they had a job too, like they do in our homes today. And then of course there's two dogs. And there's some wives. And like I say, the cook would bring his family with him. Or the, the, the owner of the company, a lot of times their families were in the camp also. 1918, 1917, 18, the United States was in World War I. They figured they would win the war in the air. So they came to the Northwest, Oregon and Washington, and set up what they called a spruce division. So instead of being in the Army, you could be in the spruce division, and your job was to log the trees so they could make airplanes out of the lumber that they were harvesting. So this is a spruce camp in Washington with their mascot. And I like this image because I got in a real argument with the guy that owned it. He told me, he says, I'm going to have to charge you big dollars for this because this guy's got a wrench in his hand. And I says, well, that don't mean nothing to me. He says, why don't you just cut that in half, and I'll take the other half of it. He says, well, why do you want it? And I made the mistake of telling him I wanted it because of the dog. Now, every time I see him, he's got dogs, but he's added a zero because he knows I'm really looking for these things. But it's just a well-posed image. And it's Sunday, one guy's going to go fishing, but he wanted me to pay. Maybe two. Maybe two. Yeah, maybe. And a young boy. Oh, I see. At the door. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, there were babies in the camp, and I got a good one later coming. You took people back from Tonkin? Yeah. What's that? The guy told that big stick? Well, at first I thought it was a stick for measuring the logs, but I think it's a fishing pole. What do you got in your hand? Um, I'm going to come to that. <laughs> All right, another scene, cat and dog. There again, this is Midwest, but this guy looks like he could be one tough Jose to me. <laughs> but they like to have their picture taken with the pipe in hand. Oh. Now this stick. Is this stick right here is a scaling stick, and that's how you would determine the board foot of a log. Now, if you're going into the logging camp, you didn't ask for the scaler. He was called a scaler, and he was also the timekeeper. If you wanted to talk to him, you say, Where's the cheater? Because the guys figured the scaler and timekeeper was always shorting them on scale and shorting them on time. So that was their logger humor that he, there's the cheater with his friend. But this stick right here, I'm using it as a pointer, is you hook it on the end of the log and it'll tell you the diameter. And I'm not sure how to make the rest of it work, but it'll also tell you the board foot in the log, board footage. Several of the camps, there was one on Larch Mountain where the mill was at the end of the line. And this is a cedar shake mill with how many dogs? That, there's more than one. There's actually two. One here and one here. And they loved them enough to even let the dogs wear their hats. Yeah. Now I talked about how there were children in the camps. That's the mess hall and bunkhouse. Now talk about primitive conditions. But here's the young boy with his pup and his mom and dad. But they were 43 miles from nowhere. Some boys out in the woods, they also tried to float logs down the river during high water, and a lot of them got stranded. So they were out just playing around by one of the logs. And this is my last slide, but I call it the next generation. And if you look real close, here's a little, little one in a stroller. And so we're looking at, this is 1908 in this image. So my conclusion is that through their photographs, you can see that there was a bond between the dogs and the camps, and that the dogs did have a role, and it meant a lot to the men. And I'm very proud of the fact that with Steve's help, we're able to put this collection together because this story hasn't been told. No one's ever talked about the camp dogs and how important they were. And the same role they have in all our lives today. All of us that have dogs, really appreciate our animals. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. When are you going to print this book? Because you're going to sell a load of them. <laughs> it's be, being edited as we speak. OK. And I'm happy to announce that, that we just came up with that title, because I came on a postcard, and I thought, 43 miles from nowhere is really explains where, where these camps were. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but yeah, I hope to have it out by Christmas. Oh, that would be good. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you.